When you see this photograph, it's, uh, let me describe it to you. It's a river in a somewhat dry tropical environment with mango trees around. Um, it has a little wooden ferry in the background, and it has a lot of boys who are taxi bike riders sheltering from the sun under the uh, mango tree. Uh, and this is the epicenter of Ebola. So those of you that thought that Ebola in West Africa was somehow a zoonotic disease that was related to proximity to the great African forest, and that there was some kind of spillover connected to the activities of hunters or bushmeat consumption. Um, I'm afraid this photograph doesn't actually give you much um, support for that model that you have in your heads. Um, the, the epicenter of the disease, it's right on the point where three countries meet, Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Liberia. Uh, the first known case was about 15 kilometers from this, the site of this photograph. The first known case in Sierra Leone was just about five miles behind where I took the photograph. And there was a huge early outbreak in Liberia that was just, the Liberian border is about two kilometers from where this uh, photograph was, was taken. And the the point about this is that the area is an extremely busy intersection in the African economy. Um, on the Sierra Leone side of the border, there was a town, or is a town, called Koindu, which was a great center of smuggling in the 1970s, 1980s. It was destroyed in the Civil War because it was a main center for dealing in diamonds. And the diamonds were all smuggled out into Guinea and into Liberia. A lot of the cocoa went into Liberia. Koindu was destroyed in the war, and it was rebuilt over the river in Guinea. And there's a, a town there uh, called Nongawa, which you'll actually see in the background of my photograph if it uh, is about to appear. Um, and the people who used to live in Koindu in Sierra Leone and did the diamond smuggling now live on the other side of the border in Guinea, in Nongoa. And this was the theater of action in which the Ebola epidemic arose. Aha, now my photograph. Did I describe it well? Yeah, you, you, you know where you are. This is, this is Nongoa, this is the ferry, uh, that's Guinea, um, this is Sierra Leone, here are the bike taxi boys, and um, all the normal features of an international border are missing. There's no police, there's no army. Um, the boys wanted to take me across. They assumed when I got out of the Jeep that I was going across. But of course, my team said, no, no, if you go across, the Guineans will arrest you, but we can go across. Um, all the families in this area are totally intermarried. The border doesn't exist. I talked to one of the border guards on, there is a bit of a border post on the Liberian side, and I talked to one of the border guards there, and he said, yeah, this, this is the border post, but there's a hundred pathways within a mile or two of this checkpoint in which people just move in and out of the, whichever country they, they choose to go to. Um, and this is not jungle, this is not forest. This is not the typical environment that we've learned to expect Ebola to emerge in in Central Africa, associated with isolated communities in deep forest, where maybe hunters come across the carcass of a, a, a dead chimpanzee and foolishly take it and cook it and eat it and become infected with Ebola. So Ebola sprang out of this environment, and to this day, we don't actually have any evidence on the original spillover dynamic. It was suggested, hypothetically, in one paper, a peer-reviewed paper, and that's one of our problems, but this was just a by-the-way by the speculation, that it might have been that this 18-month-old child had been eating bats, or maybe playing in a place where bats were living. His parents deny vehemently that this could have been possible. Locally, they tell different stories. They talk about a woman, a Sierra Leonean woman, who came from the diamond center of Koidu, which is a different place from Koindu. Um, and she had a disease that sounded suspiciously like Ebola, 
long before the first outbreak, much earlier in 2013. And the, the hypothesis that many Sierra Leoneans come to, now that they know that Ebola is a sexually transmitted disease, they say this is just connected with human networks in Africa to do with diamond smuggling. There's an outbreak in the town of Kikwit in the DR Congo in 2012, and the Lebanese Shiites that handle a lot of the diamond trade in Upper West Africa move from diamond field to diamond field buying diamonds. They often take their trusty household members with them. It's just as likely a hypothesis in my view that um, this was connected with that outbreak and was always human to human transmission. And what we know certainly is that all the transmission of Ebola in Sierra Leone was human to human. The molecular evidence is quite clear on that. And my colleague in Anjala, uh, Ayalebi, has been taking blood samples from bats now for the last 18 months, um, working in cooperation with CDC, and has found no evidence of Ebola in bats. Uh, my colleague Roland Sulaku has actually s collected bats on an island in this river that you see in the background there. Um, and it's true that people do eat bats, but whether there's any connection with bat eating and the spread of Ebola, we don't know. So, one of the problems with Ebola was that it spread far faster than the responders could cope with. They thought this was a very remote area. They conceptually treated it as if it was a zoonotic disease and armed all the health messaging to say, don't eat bushmeat. When I did a survey in 2015, the single most widely known fact, in inverted commas, about Ebola was that it's connected with eating bushmeat. And many people said, well, I'm, I'm safe from Ebola. I'm never going to catch Ebola because I never eat bushmeat. I'm a Muslim. I don't eat those sorts of things. Um, this was a fatal diversion of attention when, in fact, the human-to-human -human spread through nursing the sick and burying the dead was a much more potent, or was the potent factor in the spread of the disease. So we had the wrong model. Also, it was very difficult for people who have vehicles with four wheels to reach the site that I've just shown you. But that doesn't mean to say that these people are locked in some kind of isolated world of family-based walking relationships. You saw the motorbike boys. Those motorcycle taxis go far and fast on the worst possible roads. Your Land Rover is struggling even to make it in the rainy season to the point where I took my photograph, whereas the bike boys are shooting into every last village carrying passengers. So it wasn't just that the international community and the national communities were slow in dealing with Ebola, but they were also unable to respond um, without realizing that at the same time, the local movements that were going on were very fast and active, and that Ebola was spreading. Ebola was spreading on the back of bikes. So that's lesson number one, that Ebola had a differential dynamic of spread. In terms of local interaction, it was spreading fast. In terms of international reaction, it was spreading slowly. And you can almost reduce it to the simplistic model I've given you of four wheels bad, two wheels good, to paraphrase Animal Farm. Um, so the necessary response, if that's lesson one, uh, that the international community and everyone else was very slow to uh, attend to the Ebola challenge, um, then we need to do something about it. And. Um, one of the suggestions here is improved infectious disease surveillance, and now Sierra Leone, at least, for, I'm not sure about Guinea and Liberia, but there's a volunteer village health worker network. Almost every village now has someone who is in the process of being trained um, to recognize 10 major diseases and to report on them. They also give them simple um, drug kits so they can deal with cases like malaria. And um, earlier, those of you who were in the Seminar B, um, when Anders Nordstrom was talking about his work with WHO in Sierra Leone, he actually showed 
uh, monthly return for this surveillance report that comes through to the Ministry of Education, uh, Ministry of Health e each month. Um, a second point, improve communications, but not necessarily improve communications for um, air-conditioned vehicles. It's much more important, as I will argue in a moment, that we deal with the final mile access. It's the, it's the, the most inaccessible villages which incubated the Ebola risk. And in Liberia, there's a, a, a very interesting program of motorbike track construction. Uh, and the, the, the challenge really is to build bridges. And you can build a bridge much cheaper to take a two-wheeled vehicle than to take a four-wheeled vehicle. And then there's an obvious point that since this is at the th intersection of three countries, there has to be better interagency cooperation at all levels, but in particular at the regional level, because there is an institution called the Mano River Union, uh, which links the three countries, but it's moribund. It's been moribund since the civil wars of the 1990s, and it urgently needs to be given a new role to help deal with some of these cross-border um, human health challenges. Um, uh, just a couple of slides, really, to show some further uh, evidence of how quickly Ebola was spreading. This is a teacher's diary from a village in which ultimately 23 people died. Uh, and he was writing that diary about this disease three months before it was officially recognized by the government of Sierra Leone that they had a problem. Uh, and this is one of the early infection chains in central Sierra Leone. This is the river in the dry season when it just looks like a tourist attraction. But uh, you go and see that in the rainy season. The first responders turned back. They couldn't cross the river to collect a blood sample to find out whether they're dealing with a case of Ebola. I'm over time, so I'm going to whiz through the rest of this. Um, the, the point that I, I was laboring earlier in terms of the way that we have models that somewhat can sometimes misdirect our thinking. Um, th there's, there are good arguments and there's good analysis of why that type of misdirection occurs. It's something you can actually analyze. You can, you can map out the ways in which the organizational ordering that you work under actually systematically selects certain kinds of hypotheses and uh, blocks others. Um, a great book on this, pioneering piece of work, was by Mary Douglas called How Institutions Think. And um, essentially I'm arguing here that scientifically trained responders didn't respond to Ebola in the same way that local communities responded to, and that created difficulties. Um, I'll skip through these pictures of the Bandajuma Ebola uh, Treatment Center. Um, and I've said all this already about one, hot cognitive, one health cognitive hotspots and blind spots. So the necessary responses um, to the issue of institutional bias is avoid clash of institutions by mapping institutional biases and understand why organizational biases of scientific de disease control and family care clash, and then create space for adjustment. And there's a story I told this morning, but I won't repeat it here, about how actually that was done in the, in the Ebola response eventually. Um, and finally, the third lesson is involve communities. And I've said enough about last mile villages and motorbikes. What I haven't said is how motorbikes are actually crucial long before there were ambulances. Motorbikes were the only means to reach some of the early Ebola cases and to take patients out as pillion passengers, or to, more importantly, in some cases, to take blood samples to confirm whether or not it was Ebola. Uh, this is part of a, a, the, the local bike riders union in Kenema organizes a, tr a training program for women riders. So uh, this is going to be a, a, a gender opportunity um, trade, they believe, in future. Um, so I've made those points now, the bike taxi riders were the first ambulances. Um, but other local actions were absolutely crucial in ending the epidemic. It was local understanding of the epidemic that finally got ahead of the epidemic. This is a bridge. You can, up at the top, there's a little bit of the platform that you walk on. This is a huge gully in the rainy season in which people drown. 
and two, uh, two community responders came out and cut down this bridge to cut them off from a, the neighboring village that had Ebola because they reasoned that that would spread the epidemic. Um, again, local initiative to quarantine people. Um, and necessary responses are to build on local volunteer action for One Health. Um, I mentioned the community health wor workers already and that the legacy of family care needs a better response than marginalization. Families are important in managing disease challenges because they're the frontline carers. And so my conclusion, where to start with applying the lessons of Ebola? We need to start applying them to malaria. I'll leave you to think about that. Thank you.